So my presentation will teach you how to build a smart fridge and will cover the subtopics of machine vision, deep learning, and building an application that leverages the cloud. If you want to follow along on your laptops, you can go to slides.com slash dpeskov slash deck slash live, but the live's optional. And feel free to share it if you want. So a little bit about myself. My name is Dennis Peskov. I work for PricewaterhouseCoopers in Washington, DC. And I work for a group called the Analytics Innovation Accelerator that works on cutting edge technology projects like this one. I'm a computer scientist and I've also used a refrigerator on a daily basis, which made me interested in working on this project. Our goal was to take an ordinary fridge and expand its capabilities. First, we wanted it to work in real time. This means that you could be in a different room or at the grocery store and be able to check what's actually in the fridge. Second, we wanted to create a global network of fridges. So we currently have one set up in Chicago as well as Florida, and we're gonna expand the fridge system to several of our global offices. And lastly, the part that I focused on was making the fridge smart. So you could have Internet of Things capabilities where you could get a real-time image from the fridge, but the fridge has no way of understanding what's actually in the image unless you program it with machine vision capabilities. Uh, so this presentation will consist of three main parts. First, I'm going to do a machine vision and deep learning general overview. Then I'm going to talk about the implementation and the steps you would actually have to take to repeat this experiment. And lastly, I'm going to discuss leveraging the cloud and building an application. But before I begin, if you're not a deep uh, uh, learning or a machine vision expert, why should you care? So here's a quote from the media pretty recently that says that computers are now better than humans at recognizing and sorting images. This is a half truth because humans can still do creative things like read and bring in outside knowledge. But at the same time, we as humans wouldn't want to sit and our entire lives be classifying things, whereas a computer does not mind. Uh, Elon Musk quips that artificial intelligence is our greatest existential threat. While this fridge will not be in the next Terminator movie or the next HAL, uh, this deep learning is a big part of artificial intelligence. And lastly, there's a very real commercial applications for this. So here's an ad from Samsung. And inconveniently, the audio doesn't work, but it's just pleasant music. So this ad shows a customer walking through a grocery store and she pulls out her smartphone and she can see that she needs milk and eggs uh, because her fridge tells her so. And then she buys the milk and eggs. And this can be applied to applications beyond fridges. So to jump into the first part, deep learning for machine vision. So if you're given an image like this, we can all recognize that this is a Pepsi can. We can read Pepsi, we might recognize the logo, but how would you tell a computer that this is a Pepsi can? Well, you might think, let's make a decision tree. Let's look for something that looks like a can. So we're looking for a general upright rectangle shape. So, and if that check mark is met, then we can check to see if the can is blue. And now, just in case there's another blue can out there, we might also wanna look for this distinct Pepsi logo. And if all those conditions are met, then it's pretty likely to be a Pepsi can. So now all we have to do is use this decision tree and we can classify millions of millions of images. Unfortunately, that wouldn't work very well because images have these, this property of being unstructured and uh, variant in nature. So here are three examples where it would fail. The leftmost image is a dark version where in detail you can still see that it's a Pepsi can but it's no longer this very bright blue uh, image. In the middle image, it's no longer an upright rectangle, it's one on the side. And in the, top, in the rightmost image, from the, angle, from the topmost angle, it's no longer a rectangle at all. And overall, images are unstructured data, which has two caveats. First, they're computationally expensive. A 256 by 256 image that's already over 65,000 numbers in a vector when you convert it over. And then considering that most colored images have three channels, that's over 200,000 numbers in a vector. 
And so when you have 200,000 of these and you're trying to extract features and do computation, this becomes very expensive very quickly. And second, in images, you have relevant and irrelevant data combined. So if we were training a model just on this data set and we told the computer, there's a can in this image, it might think that the actual can is the, Im is the image in question, but at the same time, it might look at the background and think that the table is actually the can. Now, one way to deal with this problem is to let the computer make some of these decisions for itself. And we can do this by leveraging deep learning. At a high level, what deep learning does is it takes a large data set and it allows the computer to train a neural network, which you can think of as a simplified decision tree that the computer builds by itself, only with numbers as opposed to common sense uh, human biases. And at the very end, it puts out a classification. And so you can do this with not only soda cans as we did, but we've also done it with cars, with different styles. You can do this with, it uh, has leading results in natural language processing uh, for certain cases. So there are a lot of different applications for this right now. And the way this neural network works is that it's set up with different layers and it's each, each layer, some mathematical operation is done. So it might take in a snippet of the image, maybe a 20 by 20 crop, and then it passes it into a layer. Then it does some mathematical computation, like maybe it adds something, maybe it does a logarithmic function, and then it passes on to the next layer. And you can have many and many different layers. So the first deep neural networks were only several layers deep, uh, but the one that won the most recent ImageNet competition was over 100 layers deep. So these are getting very expensive, because when you first set up a neural network, the weights are completely off. You can try to guess what would work well, but most likely it's not going to give you a great classification off the bat. And this is where the artificial intelligence comes in. This neural network trains itself, it sees what's going wrong, and it gradually makes tweaks. And for the purposes of this presentation, this is all you have to know about deep learning. If you're interested, please reach out to me. I can direct you to some great online resources for learning fun things like backpropagation. But if you're interested in jumping in and actually implementing deep learning, here's the sort of the tech stuff that you should be aware of. The stack that you need for deep learning begins with a graphics processing unit. You can do this technically on a CPU, but the graphics processing unit is so much faster that it's really worth having. On top of this, you have CUDA. Uh, this is a framework that was mentioned earlier in the presentations that allows the computer to switch back efficiently between the CPU and the GPU. On top of this, you put a deep learning framework. A uh, deep learning framework makes the programmer's job much easier because you're not starting from scratch. You don't have to code all these layers. You don't have to code all the neurons or in what happens in between. You, at a high level, it creates the architecture that you need. And lastly, if you want to make your own life easier or maybe your end users, you can put in a GUI on the, at the very end. And the, historically, the three main deep learning frameworks were Torch7, Theano, and CAFE. And we personally did our deep learning using CAFE. And most recently, Google released TensorFlow into the mix. In addition, we use Digits, which is, allows visualization of the neural network, as well as it allows you to train neural networks with very minimal coding, if desired. So that was the high level overview. Now let's discuss how to actually build the fridge. And within the implementation, there are three main phases. First, there's the Internet of Things component. How do you actually make a fridge capable of communicating and posting everything online? Then there's the data generation component. And lastly, after you generate the data, you can build models. So here are real images from the fridge and taken by the fridge. It all began, we have an emerging tech lab at PricewaterhouseCoopers that works on a lot of the hardware stuff. And they took a Raspberry Pi, which is a $35 computer. They put in a camera, they put in various sensors, and they rigged it up into the fridge. And you can see it in the leftmost image in the bottom. That's what it actually looks like uh, wired up there. And now whenever the fridge is open and closed, it automatically takes a photo and posts this online. In addition, you also have temperature sensors, 
you can see what temperature the fridge is, if it's closed, open, all of these convenient features. And then when, these, when the door opens and closes, it takes a photo, and this is an actual image on the right. So it's a pretty high quality one, and uh, obviously depending on how you set up the camera is gonna affect how the photo ends up looking. All right, so now that we have a fridge that can take a photo, we wanna start building our models. But before we can build any models, we need good data. Uh, now, initially for deep learning, we started aiming for a data set of 200,000 images. Now, you can't find one for specific soda brands anywhere online. No one has done this type of work before. So we wanted to create this data set by ourselves. I personally did not want to take 200,000 images of various soda cans. So we found the nifty shortcut. Uh, I ended up taking a 10 minute video of each soda can from different angles, different lightings, different backgrounds. And then I took 20 clips per second uh, from this video. And this generated a data set of around 60,000 images. Then I ne needed still more uh, data and I duplicated the images. Uh, each one, I put in random 5% noise and duplicated that three times. So now the data set came close to 200,000 images. And things you should be aware of when building a data set is the background, the lighting, the angles, and the number of classes. All of those things will ultimately matter because overfitting becomes a real issue in model building. And now that you have this robust data set, uh, we wanted to build two separate models. The first task that we had to achieve was we needed to decide, is this image a can or is it something else entirely? In a fridge, you're not going to have all soda cans. You might have a gallon of milk, you might have candy. And so you want to be able to decide that off the bat. And then if with a certain probability, this item is a can, then you can pass it into the second model, which determines which brand of can this is. We trained this on 10 different brands, and these were generally the 10 most popular brands in the US, give or take based on availability. And within the actual models, we took two separate approaches. For one approach, we used a pre-trained ImageNet uh, competition winning uh, deep learning network. And this is trained to recognize a whole host of different images. But we use this not to do the classification, but just to extract the relevant features in the image. Now we had a, a lot of vectors for all the images. And on top of this, we built logistic regressions and support vector machine models. Uh, but this ultimately led to overfitting. And we found that what worked better for us was using a complete deep, lear deep learning network. So we trained this on uh, digits. And it took us 11 hours to train. And this is on our personal Titan GPUs. So a, with a CPU, this would be mind numbing. Uh, so hence, highly recommend using a GPU in the stack. And uh, this is uh, to demonstrate a little bit of digits. You can separate the data conveniently. You can see how accuracy improves over time. So we trained this over 30 iterations and basically it, overall, the accuracy improves a little bit. Uh, you can set the hyperparameters, which is important for training, uh, doing deep learning. And now when you have this model, you can build, you can actually use this for classification. All right, so now we can take a Coke image. And we'll copy. Oh, that's inconvenient. Okay. 
and you can actually run it through the model, and it decides that this is a Coke can with 99.79% probability. So that's the benefit of uh, using a deep learning approach. And in addition, one additional benefit is if this, this is a pretty obvious Coke can, but if it was something slightly off, uh, I was going to demonstrate an image where a dog is dressed up in a Dr. Pepper can. It would still classify it as a Dr. Pepper can, but because of, I'm, I'm comfortable with Internet Explorer, I'm just going to skip that part. Okay. And now that you have a model that can classify soda cans, you run into a further problem. So we trained this to classify one can, and that worked well on that. But however, in a fridge, you can have all these different items. So we want to be able to determine what is actually potentially a soda can in the fridge. To do this, we use the machine vision algorithm called selective search to identify rev relevant parts of the image. And this would look at different textures, different colors, different shadings, and for this specific example, it return around 500 different potential relevant parts. Now, on top of that, I created some functions that removed the overlap and looked for a given size, which could realistically be a soda can. And for this specific example, it would return three boxes conveniently drawn right around the soda cans. And now you could pass in that crop into the models and get a classification back. And you would also have the coordinates of where these cans are located, which you would pass back uh, to the interface. Uh, and one additional uh, variation we're looking at is leveraging a regional convolutional ne neural network. And this does the selection and the classification in one step. So here's an example where it was pre-trained on identifying bottles. And we just put if something's at least 50% a bottle, then it would pick it up. And you can see it draws boxes around the bottles as well as the cans because they look close enough to a bottle. All right, and the last part is we had this computer science program that worked in IPython Notebook, and we wanted to allow our fridges to work with this application. So to do this, we used Flask and Python. Uh, this basically just required that we specify what happens at given URL extensions, what happens if something goes wrong, and it was a very easy transition. In addition, because the cloud wouldn't necessarily have all the Python libraries that we needed. We created a designated Python environment, which had a lot of things pre-installed like Cafe, OpenCV, and we would pass that on whenever we loaded an image. We did version control with Git. This was important, especially when you're paying by the hour for a machine. In case something goes wrong and you forget to pay and the machine goes down, it's very good to have everything backed up. And lastly, uh, just a plug for documentation, we worked with two different groups at PwC on this, so it was good to label what every function does, everything that's not completely obvious, and to have communication between the two groups. And our takeaways from very hands-on experience is a cloud GPU allowed us to do the processing literally six times faster. So we, when we tried this with a standard CPU, it would take 30 seconds to do the compilation. Uh, but then, when we upgraded to the GPU, we could do, get it done in five seconds. And this had very real results. Because we had simultaneous users, and in theory with a global network, you could have a lot come in at once. It would work well for 10 or 20 requests, but then we, when we scaled it up to 50 or 70 at a time, it would start timing out, which would cause unexpected errors. In contrast, with a GPU, you can scale this up quite a lot further. And then it, you can also put in a queuing system that would make it more robust. Second, we found that this is fairly af affordable. Uh, for example, a K80 GPU costs $5,000 or so. But at Nimbix, you can spin it up for several dollars an hour. And you don't have to deal with a lot of the headaches that happen if your computer goes off, all of those things. And lastly, it's reliable. So we personally built this out on our own. GPUs at first and then transition into the cloud. And whereas, and the main reason for that was because our computer would periodically be used for other things or turned off, something would happen, and then we would have to have someone go in into Chicago and reboot everything up. Whereas when you have it on a dedicated cloud, 
we did not have any ex uh, unexpected outages or any of those issues. And here's the actual interface, uh, what it looks like now. If the internet loads. And I bet it's not optimized for Internet Explorer, which would be quite comical. Is it Java-based? Oh, there you go. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. well, so you can also see that image. And then within each box, you can click through. Uh, so that's what the actual image is, and it's picking up three items in there. And it can see, a. it thinks this is a Mountain Dew can, which is great. And then I can provide feedback. And it thinks it's a 100% a Mountain Dew can, which is great. So I can say that this is correct. And we're also tracking classification accuracy for building future models. And we have historical data as well, where we can go through uh, past dates and what was historically in the fridge. All right, so here are the lessons we learned that I hope to impart on you. Basically, a GPU works very fast, especially for tasks of machine vision and deep learning. Using a cloud is relatively cheap and a little bit less of a hassle. And overall, even undertaking a complex project like this is fairly easy in a world where there's a lot of open source capabilities. And as more and more people contribute to the open source environment, this becomes even easier. Now here are the painful lessons I learned that I hope you don't have to learn. Uh, always back up your data, use something like Git. One time I built something out on the cloud and then I forgot to pay for it and the cloud was gone. And so I lost that work. Uh, remember to work together. We were working with a different group, so the interface group. If we had changed something on the back end without talking to them on the front end, they might get a completely unexpected result, and it might screw up their system. And lastly, with machine vision, we ran into some overfitting issues, especially at the start, where if it was unsure, it would skew towards Pepsi for whatever reason. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have a very distinct training, validation, and test data, and you want to go through and make multiple models. All right, so thank you very much for your time. My name is Dennis Peskov. Please reach out if you have any questions about smart fridges, deep learning, or PwC at, at large. Thank you. So, Dennis, yeah, I have a comment and I have a question for once that I want to ask. So the comment is that I think that was a different cloud provider that just killed your data, I would assume, because Nimbix would actually tell you before we did it. So just, just wanted to say that. Um, and then the question I have is I, I, what you mentioned about the dog and the Dr. Pepper thing. Uh, I assume that if I, if I dress my dog in a Dr. Pepper sweater and put her in your fridge, you're going to identify her as a Dr. Pepper can. And that sounds really silly, but that's what happens when machine vision fails, right? I mean. Uh, that's one thing that as humans, we we can see something and know immediately, hey, that's somebody dressed up as something else. My question is, what do you think it's going to take What you know, to close that gap, like uh, just at a high level, right? Well, data is, the very short answer is data. And in this specific example, so this was trained on 10 soda cans, and it's never seen anything else in its short cloud life before. Uh, however, if that had been trained on the 10 soda cans and a dog, then it would be have much more mixed feelings. Is this a dog? Is this a Dr. Pepper can? It would probably split something 50-50 along those lines. So it's just a matter of having an appropriate training set and knowing what the actual task is that you want to get out of it. So, the, But the key is to know ahead of time what the negatives are going to be. And, and I, you know, otherwise, that's kind of one, one place where humans, so anyone who's afraid of machines <laughs> taking over, uh, I think there's a while to go still before they do, because that, that's a huge gap in, in machine learning, right? Yeah, we don't have to worry about that until the next Nimbix conference. Uh, hope, hopefully not. Yeah. So I was curious about the overfitting issue, because this uh, one of the things that I've run into with machine learning as well. So you talked about the uh, the small data set you're working with, and and separating out testing and validation and training. Um, but is this really just something that's solvable by, by, by size of your data set? Well, so we actually, we initially started with a 200,000 image data set and we actually ended up scaling it down. 
So it's not necessarily a, a size thing as it is just having good variation within the data. Uh, so once again, uh, for the next steps that we are looking at, it's not training even more data, it's training better data. Uh, so we want to have a more realistic fridge environment. I think ideally it would have very unique photos of soda cans within the fridge itself. Then that would be much less of an overfitting issue and it would be, or at least it would work well in this specific designation. So is this somewhere, uh, something where a, uh, like an open source image repo would, would, would be helpful? Kind of, you know, so other people don't have to reinvent the wheel that you've built. So that's a double-edged sword. Maybe you might get a lot of great images, but you also don't necessarily know what you're getting with an open source image library. Uh, so because I created this data set and I know exactly what went into it, I know every single image is an image of a soda can rather than a dog, which has its advantages. Uh, so, um, so Leo showed a uh, sort of like an IoT sort of pipeline where you find you get data in, you do some um, some processing, and then out you get your your intelligence, your uh, sort of analytics. Do you are, are like how did would would you be able to use your application and and basically send real time uh, footage to Nimbix and and use your use your algorithm and get something back on your phone, for example? Do you see uh, do you see that that like that would work right now? So uh, personally, I haven't thought about that. Okay. I think we have a very like hand coded algorithm algorithm right now. Yeah. So I'm not sure how to transition that over. We're just using the GPUs for the processing power as opposed for the actual like algorithm stuff. Because it's a cool idea. It's almost like you know coprocessor in the cloud kind of thing. It's it's a it's an interesting concept and yeah. it'd be interesting to see a, a use case. Uh, second question is: uh, Do you believe the uh, singularity will happen on the mix? <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that? Your okay. question was, do you believe the singularity will happen on the Nimbus cloud? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Good answer. There are there are uh closed caption speed and cameras throughout the and getting the and The deep learning it appears very, very similar to semantic, uh, semantic knowledge, semantic technology. Am I correct in my statement? And if I am correct, can you state some differences? I'm not sure of the intricacies of semantic knowledge, so I can't answer that in an intelligent fashion. I understand. Just a really quick question. It's on. Um, in, your, in the website, you showed that you were gathering feedback on whether things were right and wrong. Are you mm -hmm. actually using that at all in your model, or are you just gathering that for your own purposes? So in the short run, we're just going to retrain our model based on what works well and what doesn't work well. In the long run, you would ideally automatically be able to have an artificial intelligence component where you could see what's going wrong and then try to adjust the model automatically. Yeah, I have a bit of a philosophical speculative question. So, you know, the rage all these days is about throwing more data at uh, machine learning uh, algorithms and, you know, <clears throat> letting it work out what's happening through statistical methods. Do you think we're going to hit a wall when we re with that approach? Do you think we need to go back to, you know, what Chomsky talks about, you know, looking at the semantics of things and thinking it, I mean, uh, a more traditional approach, which uh, was popular in the 70s and 80s, like trying to understand what's going on and work it out. What do you think? Yeah. Well, clearly there is a lot of hype around this right now, and I don't think this is going to be the end-all be-all. Uh, we're clearly not at a master algorithm uh, part of a computation. Uh, but at the same time, this is the current, it provides the best results right now for a lot of image classification tasks, uh, v vision classification, and natural language stuff. Uh, but once again, it's, it depends on the task. So the final answer is it depends. I've only walked over that a hundred times. So, um, in in VR, like a uh, virtual reality, in something of of this, if you wanted to, uh, you know, do three sixty views and things of that nature, would this work? S same um, imagery, if you wanted to, you know, would that would that help in 
the, the, you know, identifying the object and things of that nature? Yeah, so I guess if you could convert the data feed that you're getting from the virtual reality into numbers, so it, because this isn't actually classifying the v images per se, it's classifying the images viewed as vectors. So if you can convert it over to vectors, then you could classify it in a pretty similar manner. I presume you've seen the recent uh, competition where they set this loose on old Atari games from the 80s. Um, do you have any uh, insight as to how that may progress into our uh, gaming world, starting to use deep learning that actually adapts to your uh, playing and starts using it against you? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, so that's he's referencing the DeepMind, which can beat Atari, and that was also the recent hype about beating AlphaGo. So I think it would make us being humans and competing against computers much more difficult. Uh, so enjoy your supremacy while it lasts. <laughs> All right. Well, Dennis, thank you very much. Very interesting topic. Thanks a lot.